Why is that going on and off? Did you notice that? But it was flashing. <laughs> How it's flashing? There's, no, not good. If there's a cable or something, it's probably not good, huh? Okay, welcome everybody. Sorry for the slow start. Hopefully everything will get together quicker next time. Um, <clears throat> welcome to Underactuated Robotics. I hope you're in the right place. I'm Russ. Uh, <clears throat> we have two awesome TAs, Yunzu and Wei here, who are experimenting with video recording <laughs> for us. Uh, so, uh, and all of us can be reached by underactuated-TAs at MIT. That's the court staff, and we thought that was funny. So. Um, uh, the website is underactuated.mit.edu for the course, for the textbook, and then if you throw spring 2019 on, you'll get the material for, for this term. Uh, we're going to go paperless in the class, so, um, you know, the syllabus is here on the, on the schedule, a detailed schedule with when the homeworks are due, when the midterm is, so uh, it's important that we give you guys all those details today. We're giving them to you via the website. Uh, also, the grading policy and the homework will be available directly on the website, okay? So, <clears throat> my goal for today, basically, I want to, well, I want to accomplish a few things. I want to uh, give you a, a, a few of the technical ideas that are going to start us up in the class. I've picked these um, Partly because that a lot of people ask me about the prerequisites for the class, and this gives me a chance to show you some of the relevant types of equations that we'll use, the linear algebra and differential equations that we'll use. So you'll get a sense sort of for um, the material, that, you know, the types of material we'll use from that. But most importantly, I'd like at the end of the lecture for you to understand what the word underactuated means in terms of, you know, so if someone on the street came up and said, oh, I heard you're taking underactuated robotics. What 
does that mean? Uh, then you should have an answer by the end of the class. Uh, that's you know a modest goal, I admit, but but let's let's get at least that much. Um, <clears throat> so I've been teaching this class a while now, uh, but uh, it's sort of fun for me in the first lecture to to reflect back on how it's even changed over over the years. And even to try to maybe tell you a little bit about how I got into the, you know, how what inspired me to start thinking about this this idea of underactuated robotics. So, if you'll humor me, let me let me tell you a little bit of the the history that that brought me to to here, and try to motivate for you um, why you should care about dynamics. Okay, uh, for me, this course started really. Uh, I noticed that a lot of computer scientists were doing excellent robotics. Uh, but didn't really think a lot about the dynamics of their robots. And similarly, there's a lot of people on campus from mechanical engineering, from Aero, that think a lot about dynamics, but maybe don't, ha don't connect as much to the optimization and machine learning types approaches, although that's changed. Um, so this is really trying to bring those together. So, so why should you care about dynamics? So I started, I got to MIT in the year 2000. It's a long time ago now. Um, and uh, I was a first year grad student at the time. I, you know, I joined the faculty in 2005, uh, but um, I was a first year faculty, and at the time there was something called the Leg Laboratory that was down in the basement of NE43, okay? Uh, that's where uh, uh, Boston Dynamics, for instance, the founder of Boston Dynamics, Mark Raybert, started the Leg Laboratory, but then he left MIT, and then when I arrived there, it was Gil Pratt was running it. And they were working on walking robots at the time. And this is actually the, the robot that probably made me come to MIT and made me want to work on uh, legged robots. This is Trudy, which was actually sort of a side project in the lab. Um, there was a guy, Pete Dilworth, who's just one of the most clever um, designers and, and builders that I've ever met. And he's building this robot um, out of hobby servos, basically. And it was just starting to walk when I got there, Trudy. And he, and he went on actually to build a... Um, a quadruped version of this, and then even to, he, he works in toy companies now. Uh, okay, so that was just, for me, in the year 2000, that was just like, oh, that's what I want to do with my life. I want to do that. And similarly, in the leg lab, there was, um, uh, there was another project called M2 going on, which is a bipedal robot. It was a more human-sized bipedal robot. That robot at the time was still sort of a mess of wires and was kind of falling down more than it was standing up. But... Um, but it, you know, there's just a very ex exciting, ex uh, you know, time to be in the lab. And I remember the day when um, some visitors from Honda came by and showed us this video. Okay, this was actually they 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 told the world and uh, they the, they had sort of in '97 they started saying that they had a project, but it was really only um, you know around the year 2000 when I got there that they. They sort of unveiled this project that had been working behind the scenes for many, many years. And this is the robot P2, okay? It was the first one they showed everybody about. And boy, when they showed this video in the leg lab, you could hear a pin drop. I was like, I was the first year student. I had just gotten there. I was like, this is awesome, right? And everybody's like, you know, we just got scooped, right? <laughs> Big time. This guy's walking around. He's walking up stairs. It was just mind-blowing. Uh, you'll see it, there's a, if I play it long enough, there's a part where he's like grabbing a cart and walking along with a cart, going upstairs. Uh, just shockingly, amazingly good for the time, right? And, um, and if you know, then the Honda continued on, and I'll show some videos later of, of the newest versions of, of their walking robots, Asimo now. Um, but just amazingly good. Okay, but at the same time, after the initial shock wore off, um, realize that it, it kind of walks funny, right? <laughs> I mean, it's actually, maybe it's, it's good, but it's, it's, you know, there's something, there's still work left to do, right? So do, do we really want our robots to be walking around like this for, uh, you know, for the rest of history, the rest of time? And there's actually, we'll understand, I hope, in, in a fairly deep way why it walks like that. And it's actually a good idea. It's, it's a very logical thing to do. Um, but it's not quite good enough. <clears throat> um, so this, at the, you know, at the same time, there was another line of work that was going on at, at other universities mostly. There was actually a, um, an aerospace engineer, Tad McGear, who uh, had been playing, at the same time that Honda had been playing, 
Ted McGeer had been playing with these, um, these toys, really, these passive toys. And then Andy Ruina at Cornell with Steve Collins um, started building what I consider to be the most impressive of these passive toys ever built. And this is, okay, so this is barely a robot, right? This is sticks and hinges and, and curved feet. Um, you put it on top of a little hill, you give it a push, and it's powered only by gravity, right? Well, it's, you know, so, so the only input is the potential energy that's turned into kinetic energy as it's walking down a hill. And I would say, compared to, as, uh, compared to the P2 video we just saw, this looks beautiful, right? This looks like someone taking a stroll through the park. It's just shockingly good, right? And it used no energy, whereas we know the P2 was burning at least 20 times the energy that a human was using as it walked, okay? Uh, even from the back side, it looks sort of elegant and good, okay? So <clears throat> I, that was sort of it. For me, that was the moment where I realized that um, the dynamics matter, right? So, so uh, P2 and even Asimo after it, the, the Honda robots and many, many robots out there in the field, um, they're actually going through, an ex they're using an incredible amount of energy in order to keep their knees bent. If you walk around with your knees bent all the time and your feet flat, you're gonna be pretty tired pretty fast, right? They're burning through a lot of energy in order to make linear control theory work well. To basically, because the equations get easier if you keep your center of mass at a constant height and you can sort of ignore impacts because you slow your foot down before you touch the ground, then you can pretty much pretend you're a, a simple system to control and simple control works well. But you pay a huge price for that, right? And this is the opposite extreme. This is do nothing. Let the world control the game, right? And it's, the benefit seems clear um, but it's way, way harder. Suddenly you have to solve, think about all the nonlinear dynamics of the system. You have to think about what gravity is going to do to me in all these different configurations. And this robot has a problem, right? It can only walk down a small ramp. And actually, if you change that ramp by about 0.1 degrees, it's not going to work anymore. It's going to take a tumble, right? That's tuned in. There's even suction cups on the kneecap that go and then let go at, at about the right time and you tune the leak on the suction cup. This is like a highly tuned, works in a narrow band kind of system. So the mystery that sort of started my, my, uh, this course really was, can you take the beautiful dynamics we see here and combine it with good control in order to try to make, get the best of both worlds? Something that could walk around, push carts, you name it, you name it but also have the elegance and energy efficiency and ultimately robustness of the passive dynamic walking, okay? And that story happens in lots of different places. So it turns out it, it plays very well with the history of the leg lab. This is, if you go back to the 80s, in between 1981 and 1984, um, the leg laboratory was producing these, these robots that were not conservatively walking around with their knees bent. These are the ones you see in the MIT Museum, by the way. Uh, this was throwing its mass through the air. This is the simplest model of a running robot when we'll study you know, the governing equations of this and, and, and how you control it. Here's a two-legged version. There's a, there's a good backstory about why you could think about humans running as if they're running on pogo sticks. And this actually had the land speed record for a, a biped for a long, long time. Okay. They could go over terrain. So, <clears throat> you know, MIT sort of had a history of having these robots be more dynamic. Now, my only complaint with those, you know, that's, this is their 3D version. Wow, right? So remember that, right? Because you're gonna see that again. This is the leg laboratory, and that's Mark Raybert, you know, leading the leg laboratory in the early 80s doing flips, right? Here's their first quadruped, which is really good. In 1984, it could pronk, bound, you name it. So this was a super compelling, very dynamic demonstration. And the controller for it was is incredibly simple, like incredibly simple. But it was sort of pulled out of a hat. Um, you know, there was intuition of the, of the designers that were working on that, 
that wrote down a handful of pretty simple equations and made it all work. And that is also very inspirational. But how do you take that and generalize it a little bit? Now if you wanted that robot to push a cart or something, then those equations go out the window and somehow we needed a, we just need to systematize the, the intuition that those guys had at the time uh, in order to make it work in, a much, in many more situations. So MIT sort of had a history of this already. Um, <clears throat> It turns out if you, if you don't care at all about legs, but you care, look into other disciplines, I found the same story coming up over and over again. So, um, you know, you look at, you look at aircraft and um, this is an F-14 landing on a carrier. It comes in at a, a you know, relatively large angle of, of attack, but it's actually a very conservative approach. Um, you know, it has to come in try to slow down as much as it can by, by leaning up into the air, right? I'll show you some pictures of, of the flow in a second. Um, it has this extra, right? So the, there's a guard hanging down here. It tries to catch the guide wire and, and, and also has to play the game that if it misses the guide wire, it has to hit the throttle fast enough to be able to take off on the other side without plunking into the ocean, right? So it's a hard problem, I admit. But this is, you know, fighter jets, state of the art, you know, more, work in modern controls for, for controlling fighter, advanced fighter jets than anything. You think of this as the pinnacle of engineering. But if you compare it to you know, what a bird does, uh, like any bird, you look out the window and, and you see a bird land on a perch and it does way better, right? So, so why is that? So th this is a cardinal landing on a perch, okay? And actually there's smoke trails that you can't quite see. Sorry about that. But um, <clears throat> you know, the post-stall flow of this if you look at the, if you put a little smoke in the air and watch how it circulates after the, the wing, this guy is in deep stall. He's actually in a completely different aerodynamic regime, right? So um, if you keep your, if you have a, a wing that's sort of parallel to the flow, then the air goes right around it. If you angle it up a little bit, 15 degrees is a, for a typical airfoil about stall, you get a little bit of separation. And if you go into a deep, I mean, the, the cardinal was actually at about 90 degrees because he was coming down. It was, we even estimated 100 degrees in one um, calculation, right? That they're in deep stall and they have big complicated airflow happening behind the wings, right? So why would the bird do that? Well, the bird do does that because if you do get this complicated flow behind you, you actually get more drag. You get more suction. This thing acts like a, it's a pressure, it's a low pressure region behind the wing, which is like hitting the air brakes. So if you want to stop fast, you should do that, right? And why doesn't the airplane do that? Well, it, because the math got harder, right? It's somehow the, that when you're in this, the low angle of attack regime, you can use basically linear optimal control and, and get the job done and have confidence intervals and all these great things. Um, and when you go up here, suddenly the airflow gets complicated enough that it's hard to use traditional control approaches. So kind of like ASIMO on the top and passive dynamic walking down here, if you're willing to go uh, you know, into this complicated regime, there's a huge performance benefit waiting for you. You just have to deal with the more complicated dynamics. Right? So um, you, know, you look in nature for these, these videos and there's so many awesome videos. Apparently the way you get like a big scary owl, Eurasian owl to land uh, on a camera is that you put a little food right here. Um, but, but watch as it approaches here. Um, <clears throat> the telltale signs of nonlinear flow here and separation, you can watch he's got some leading edge feathers um, that you're gonna see the separation right on the leading edge of, the, of this bird, of the, of the wing. But it's pretty clear if you've thought about airfoils at all that this, this goes into a very deep stall. You, know, you can watch those leading edge feathers ruffle up. There they go. All right? So why don't our airplanes do that? All right? Wouldn't that be cool and terrifying? <laughs> So, um, you know, we did some experiments back in the day saying, actually, you can do that. In fact, we built some flapping uh, planes and, and whatever. We un ended up proving that even a super simple foam airplane with flat wings can land on a perch if you do good enough control, right? So um, that was a high-speed video slowed down, and it goes into a very deep um, post-stall aerodynamics. 
which we built an entire wind tunnel just to take this one picture to convince you that, uh, you know, that, that in fact we are, we're in a complicated nonlinear dynamics regime and uh, we we're still able to do enough control to land on a perch. Right? So that's you know, the kind of thing we, we hope to be able to do with the tools from the class. And in the end, you take that exploiting dynamics idea and you add it with some ideas from robust control and you can get it to be not only high performance but also more robust. This is a very simple system. It's got a single actuator in the tail, so one motor. Um, but Joe's goal was to be able to throw it and have it always land on, this, on the perch. And it did. Um, you know, I could sort of go off on, on lots of these different stories, but albatrosses are incredibly efficient when they fly across the ocean. Um, their cost of transport is about the same as a 747 going across the ocean, okay, but, uh, but they do it at a very much, it's much harder to get that same cost of transport at this scale. Uh, in fact, so, so, so how do they do that? Well, they're exploiting dynamic soaring over the ocean, right? So you exploit the fact that um, if the wind is blowing over the ocean, at the, at the surface of the, of the water, the wind is going the same speed as the water, and then it goes up in velocity in a parabolic sort of curve as you, as you go up in, in, in Z. Uh, and these birds make nice dynamic soaring maneuvers to, in order to go fast at some high angle of attack and go slow and do these looping maneuvers and are able to go uh, for days without flapping their wings, we think. It's, there's, it's been hard to track them. But at the time, you know, at the time I looked at them a lot, they were, it was, it was uh, expected, but not completely proven. Uh, another funny thing about that is you can measure the, um, the energy that these things use, and, and they, are, uh, they actually use about the same energy when they're flying over the ocean as when they're sitting on the beach, which maybe means they're extremely inefficient on the beach, um, but, <laughs> but it was impressive to me. And, and, you know, you see falcons dive at 140 miles an hour or whatever people talk about. They've heard 180. Uh, and that's impressive, but bullets go fast too. Engineering systems go fast. The thing that's impressive about a falcon dive is the last moment when the prey is going this way and the falcon's going this way at 140 miles an hour, and it suddenly will, will bank just like that at, at top speed, grab the pigeon or whatever it is, and off it goes, right? So I want our robots to do that. There's stories of bats that can, uh, that, I mean, not, there's lots of evidence now of, of bats that can be flying full speed this way and then suddenly be flying full, full speed this other, in the other direction and they do the entire maneuver in like half a body length, right? It's just great. Um, this is one of my favorites too. So this is a, a hummingbird at Berkeley. Uh, it's, you know, the wind, it's in, a, it's in a wind tunnel so the wind's blowing trying to knock it around a little bit. Um, and it's keeping its beak perfectly in this, uh, this little feeder, right? Which is incredible station keeping in a, in a fairly complicated flow. But let me just play that again. There's actually a series of videos. I just, this is just the last one. Um, you see that airflow error in the back? So it's actually flying backwards at about three meters per second. So, so whether, the, whether the, the wind's going this way, this way, or nothing, the, you know, the, the basic, you, you wouldn't be able to tell in the video unless you're, you've studied uh, these birds, but this guy's doing the backstroke at three meters per second, which is a pretty good clip, and able to maintain perfect station keeping in its, in its nose. Right? So, <clears throat> okay, but here's my favorite one of all time, so then I'll stop. Um, this is a set of videos from, um, from George Lauder and Mike T from, from uh, ocean Mechanical and Ocean Engineering. <clears throat> um, I think this seals the deal. If you ask, do animals exploit dynamics? Uh, this, is my, this has got to be the best, okay? So this is a rainbow trout in a water tunnel. This is a view from above, looks a little shadowy, but this is a view from above of a rainbow trout. Okay, so if you look at a rainbow trout when it's swimming in a water tunnel, that's how it swims. That's just the nominal basic gait, okay? Um, so they did an experiment. They said, I wonder, so rainbow trout are the ones that swim upstream at mating season. And they, people, they, people notice that if the water's coming this way uh, and there's rocks, you know, we know that there's complicated flows behind a rock. They've noticed that these trout sometimes hang out behind the rocks. Okay? So maybe there's something clever going on there. So let's put a rock in the water tunnel. And there's one just off the side here. The flow's going this way, same, same direction as that arrow. Okay, let's see if we put a rock in there, does the fish swim differently? Okay, um, 
And it does. It completely changes its gait. Um, <clears throat> and the, the idea there was that actually it's, it's tuning itself in. They call it the von Karman gate. So there's a von Karman vortex street coming off the, the cylinder, and it manages to sort of ride its body right between the waves in a beautiful way. I think that's pretty con convincing. But this one's even better, OK? So this one here is a dead fish. Dead, OK? It's not alive. Uh, there's a piece of string making sure it doesn't go far, too far back into the, you know, get caught in the grates. That would be annoying. Um, but let's just see what happens if you strap a dead fish to a st loose string and put it behind the same cylinder, okay? So now it's just getting knocked around by the vortex street. That's kind of what they expected. They wanted to study that. And then totally surprising was when the dead fish swam upstream, right? And consistently, okay, the dead fish just swims upstream, right? So um, this is not a statement about the nervous system of the fish. The, that's turned off, apparently. Um, this is just something about the design of the fish that is so cleverly designed for its, its environment that it's able to exploit the nonlinear dynamics in the fluid and whoosh, swim upstream, OK? All right, so biology seems to be, I, I'm sold that, that you know, biology seems to be exploiting dynamics in a pretty awesome way. Um, and it's really annoying that our machines mostly don't. And we've gotten better a little bit, um, but still, there's, there's more to do, right? So, um, you know, this is, I, I do think we've gotten better, right, a lot. So the, there's, there's cool things that happen now. You know, you can buy a drone uh, that people, you know, we were talking about these in lab just a few years ago, and now you can suddenly buy a drone that's going to track you through... Uh, Taking out just awesome videos of, of quadrupeds doing amazing things. That's my favorite because it's an older one, but you've seen the newer quadruped videos probably too. They're just awesome. Um, Asimo got way better, right? It's still walking like this, right? We'll talk about that, but it's really good. It can run, um, I would say, fairly well. Uh, you know, we, my, my group and, and some of the students in CSAIL, uh, you know, participated in this DARPA Robotics Challenge and, and put these, this humanoid robot through a, a series of experiments where it had to drive a car, walk into a building, pick up tools and use them, walk over rough terrain. So robots are getting better. That one still walks with its center mass kind of level, but um, you know, this is my favorite video of all time. This is, that's, this is the next generation of the robot we got to use. This is Atlas V2, if you will. And it's way, way, way more powerful than anything we had and lighter. Oh, but that's just so awesome, right? <laughs> Best video of all time. By the way, like most of the people that work on that robot have taken this class. I'm just saying, I don't know. I, but uh, uh, so your final projects need to be pretty good. Um, OK. So <clears throat> roughly speaking, the goal of this class is to, to tell you how to do that uh, with your robots. Um, if you don't have a humanoid robot at your disposal, and particularly one that's that good, then uh, we'll give you a simulation. Uh, and hopefully some of you have your own robots too that we can, we can help make better. But I want to convince you more generally that dynamics matter even if you don't care about backflips. Um, uh, the secret for me is really that I actually think um, more, much more broadly than even doing backflips or, or swimming upstream if you're dead. Um, I think the dynamics view of the world is it's a, sort of a lens on computation, really. And we use the same lens to think about, for instance, trying to prove that a deep neural network on an autonomous car isn't going to drive off the road, or um, you know, all kinds of pretty of, of complicated systems. Increasingly, we're thinking about manipulation in the lab, as I, th I think it's one of the, the new capabilities that are really going to get unlocked with the, with this next couple of years of research. Uh, 
and that involves deep connections with perception and planning. Uh, and I think the dynamical systems view of the world is the right lens to view all that complicated computation. So uh, let's dig in a little bit. So a lot of people um, ask me sort of what do you need for the class, right? Um, really, this is a class about nonlinear dynamics. <coughs> um, I want you to love dynamics by the time you're done, I hope. Um, but it's really, uh, you don't have to know a lot of dynamics to do the stuff in the class. I'm going to try to introduce the core ideas. I, it's, in fact, the point is to convince people who haven't been thinking about dynamics that you should think about dynamics. But it's also about computation. And um, it's really how do you program nonlinear dynamics, um, especially with uh, optimization is a big tool that we're going to use a lot. So we'll do a lot of work on, um, on algorithms for reasoning about dynamics. And in particular, uh, you'll, I hope you'll come away with a lot of new tools from optimization. Also from um, also planning. I think you'll get a lot of, uh, you'll see planning in more classes on campus for robotics. Um, but I think the optimization focus of this class is maybe a little bit more unique. Um, I think what you need is some comfort with uh, linear algebra and differential equations. Let me say ODEs, ordinary differential equations, and I'll and I'll I'll do some today just so you see them, right? We have um, problem sets in Python. You don't have to be a Python expert, but we are going to use Python in the class. Uh, what you don't need is to be, uh, you don't really need a lot of robotics background. You don't need to know your robot kinematics and dynamics. If you do, that's awesome. We're going to try to make the software mostly hide that from you, so you don't have to. Um, I'm not even expecting people to know control, um, although I hope you will feel like you know a lot more of it by the end. I think if you did know some optimization, I think people have, there's two types of people that go through the course. Some have a comfort with optimization going in, and I hope that you'll that will continue to grow for you. If you don't know a lot about optimization theory uh, or algorithms or you know, applied optimization, I'd say now, then you'll certainly be exposed. I would say that's, I, I sometimes think maybe that would be a good thing to, to study up on before, but I, I try to not make it a prerequisite. <clears throat> yeah? Any questions? Okay, so um, let me start with some, some basic definitions. I'd like you to know what underactuated means. Am I writing large enough for those of you up at the top? Yeah, just barely? Good, all right. So um, the basic building block of the course is nonlinear differential equations. And, uh, you know, in most cases, they'll take this kind of a form where x is, this, is a vector of state variables. U is a vector of control inputs. Uh, 
That means this is a vector valued function. And x dot is the time derivative, right? So x dot is my not is the common notation for the time derivative of x, right? So <clears throat> we'll we'll show many examples. You need some vector which describes the current state of the world of your robot, and you're going to talk about how does that evolve over time. And the interesting case is if you have some actuators or some control to get to affect how that dynamics works. You get to pick u in order to control x. Right? Um, <clears throat> for mechanical systems, there's, this, is, this is a hopelessly generic, not hopelessly, but in, for many, many cases you can do a lot better if you know that f has some structure. It's not just a black box, f. So for mechanical systems, For instance, we know that uh, F equals MA, right? We know that the dynamics are second order. They, they deal with, if you know your positions and velocities, then you're going to get it, and your, your input forces, you'll get an acceleration out. So there's second order dynamics, which means um, We're going to call Q our position vector, or we'll call uh, Q the, all the positions in the system. It could be joint angles, it could be uh, the horizontal position of a, of a slider joint or something like this. <clears throat> Q dot is going to be the velocity vector. When we go to write it in the original first order form, that just means we would choose our state vector to be q, q dot. You can just concatenate those two and you have a full state description. And then the second order dynamics you might write out like this. Occasionally, you'll see in the code, you might see V. Um, you'll see a V used in the place of Q dot. And that's for a sort of a subtle reason that if you end up dealing with, there, there are types of um, joints even that you might, that it might be a, you'd like a slightly different representation for velocity than just the time derivative. So, uh, and that carries through. Sometimes we use V in the software even when we just mean Q dot. In this class, uh, we always just mean Q dot, even if you see V. But for instance, the quaternion, you'd use four numbers to represent Q, but you can use only three numbers to represent V. And so you wouldn't, you, you know, you might have a, a different uh, Q dot. Yes? Thank you. Good call. Please do catch me on those. That's, I appreciate that. OK, now we're going to dig in even a little bit more. So mechanical systems actually, um, we know more about them than, we actually know a lot more about them than just being second order. In fact, in most of the systems we're going to look at in this class, not all, but in most of them, uh, the way that U enters these equations is importantly simple. It's, it's going to be that this equation is going to be uh, affine in U, okay? So, which means I could write this in even a more specialized form. I've got some bunch of terms that depend on Q and Q dot, some other terms that depend on Q and Q dot, but with a linear dependence on U, okay? When you have a structure like this, we call this control affine. And it's going to help. It's going to help us make uh, right algorithms that exploit that. 
even when the dynamics are extremely rich and complicated, the control inputs often enters in a simple way. And that really is F equals MA. That's this, this basic property. If U is a torque that comes out of a motor, then it affects your accelerations in a linear way. Okay? <clears throat> All right, so now we're ready to think about what it means to be underactuated. Let me start by saying what's fully actuated, okay? A system is fully actuated And really, it's um, it's a function. It's potentially a function of state. But let me so in state q q dot if f two q q dot is full row rank. So it seems like a little bit of an obscure math, you know, mathematical statement. I just talked about backflips, and now you went and pulled a full row rank statement on me. Um, but it turns out that's everything. That matters. Um, and so let me try to convince you of that. So just to make that concrete, so let's say that um, I have n joints on my robot, OK? And let's say I have the dimension of u is m. Um, that means how big is F2? That means for every Q and Q dot I put in, I get F2 out as a matrix, right? That is of size n by m, matrix. So what does it mean then to be full row rank? I need the dimension, I need the rank of this to be at least n, right? It can't be more. Okay, so how could that happen? Well, um, well, let me let me let's do the underactuated one first, just to say the obvious thing. Now, is that uh, a second sort a second order system of that form is underactuated drop rank. Okay. So for instance, if M is less than N, then this matrix is not a square matrix. It's a tall matrix. And it will have not have full rank. Okay? Just thinking about the equations I put on the board. I'll try to connect it to your mechanical intuition in a second here, okay? So if you, if you have 10 joints to control, but you could only afford four actuators, then you're in a situation where your robot is underactuated. I have a friend, Manoli Kellis, who likes to joke, he says, Ross, if you had more research funding, would you study fully actuated robots? Um, no. Uh, okay, so, so certainly if you don't have enough actuators, that's, it's possible. Um, that's not exclusively, um, that's not the only way you could be underactuated, right? I could have, um, maybe I bought 50 actuators for my 10 degrees of freedom, but I hooked them all up to the same joint, right? So I've got like a, a, one robot here, and, and that sounds crazy, but that's sort of what our human body does. We've got all, tons and tons of, of actuators wired up to single joints, right? Um, but let's say I, I left one part of my robot over here with no motors, uh, it's still underactuated in that case, okay? 
turns out, if you're a humanoid robot doing a backflip, even though you spend, I mean, that robot is awesome, right? They, they have, they titanium weld, or they titanium 3D print uh, the, the valves for the hydraulics, right? I mean, like, you couldn't, they're custom actuators, everything, you couldn't spend more per actuator, right? They have research funding, right? But that robot's still under-actuated, okay? Because when the robot's flipping through the air, none of those actuators control the trajectory of the center of the mass, right? That center mass is going ballistic through a ballistic arc no matter what those actuators do, unless they flap enough to do aerodynamics. But uh, assuming no aerodynamics, uh, that robot is still under-actuated. I'm, I'm under-actuated, right? I've got lots and lots of muscles, um, but nothing I can do can make my center of mass pull towards the ground faster than gravity, unless I've got something stuck in my shoe, right? So, so um, these can be non-trivial statements, okay? So why does that matter? Why is that such a big deal? <clears throat> When you're thinking about control problems, linear control is relatively easy, okay? So if I had a linear dynamical system, this would be the matrix form of my differential equation, but this is a linear version where A is just a matrix, B is a matrix, right? This would be a linear dynamical system. then actually we know a lot about how to control this, rope, this system. If I had a linear dynamical system, then I can use linear optimal control, I can use lots and lots of techniques in order to design a controller U for this system. And we'll, we'll use some of them and extend some of them uh, for sure in the class, okay? Um, <clears throat> but I have, if, if I have this more complicated system that's, um, my nonlinear system, but it's control affine. Then there's a really important idea out there, which is one of the ideas in that definition I just erased, the first maybe core idea of the class. There's an idea called feedback linearization. Okay. Imagine I'd like Q double dot to be, I have a goal for what accelerations I'd like to produce. So let me use the notation Q double dot D for desired accelerations. Okay, now <clears throat> watch this. What if, what if I just write, imagine a controller, so the game, name of the game is going to be, let's design some rule for picking U as a function of Q and Q dot that tries to control the system, okay? Imagine I choose this for U. Can you see that okay? So this assumes that I know F1 and F2, which means I have, to have a, I have to know the governing equations of my robot. But even in cases where I don't know them perfectly, we can make statements like this. It also assumes that I can take the inverse of F2, okay, in all Qs. Then what happens if I pop this into my nonlinear equation? So U here, it's going to cancel F2, boom, I get Q double dot here, minus this U1, boom, you know, and, and off I go, I can get um, I guess I need parentheses there, sorry about that. Then I get uh, Q double dot equals Q double dot desired. 
which is a linear system, which I know a lot of things about how to control. Okay? So I made a, a quick assumption about knowing this, uh, knowing the equations of motion exactly, but let's put that one aside. The big assumption I made here is that I could invert F2. If I can invert F2, then I can apply a, a trivial controller to replace the dynamics of my system with a linear system. And then I can do control on a linear system. Does that make sense? What is this condition? When, uh, under what conditions can I invert F2? If you're full row rank, right? So if the system is fully actual, so this is exactly the, the condition of trying to understand that you're fully actuated. Yeah. So that's sort of implied. Yep. Yeah. But you're right, right on. So um, <clears throat> if my system is fully actuated, I, I, so I have to be careful here. I'm not trying to like piss off everybody who's worked on, on robots for a long time and saying it's all trivial. But roughly speaking, if you have enough, if you have big enough actuators and you've got enough of them and you, you're, you're fully actuated, then control is kind of easy. You can take whatever dynamics you want, measure your state, that can be subtle, you know, know your dynamics, that can be subtle. But basically you can replace your dynamical system with a linear system and do linear control. If you do, then what happens is you start walking like this, right? And sometimes that makes sense. Like if you don't want to fall down, that's not a bad thing to do, okay? Um, but there's a huge cost potentially in what you need to do in order to run this controller. It might be that you have to um, put very large effort into you, like the, the total um, work done by the actuators might be extremely high if you have to cancel out the dynamics of your robot all the time, right? So this might not be a good controller. It might not even be a, the most robust controller because canceling out the dynamics, if the dynamics were helping you, then don't cancel them out, right? This is literally, the controller you would use, it's also sometimes called computed torque or, or other things, but it's feedback linearization is the key idea. Uh, then I can, if I, if I have enough control effort, then I can replace my dynamics with whatever dynamics I want and, and simplify the control. Okay. The way I presented it, you'd say like, oh, nobody would actually do that. Okay, everybody does that. Everybody does that. Like for years and years, that's basically all we know how to do. It's really annoying. Um, so, you know, I had to make a class that probably said, okay, there's another way to do this thing and let's try to talk about it for a whole semester. Um, okay, so that's the key idea. If you're fully actuated, then you don't have to be control hungry and you don't have to use this controller. There are other, like, it's good to know how to exploit your nonlinear dynamics, even if you have enough actuators to be fully, um, fully actuated. But it's just such an easy trap to say I know exactly how to control this system um, and I'm going to cancel out the dynamics and turn it into a linear system. Now I, I do want to note it's, it does not quite the same. It's, it's tempting to say that I can take a fully actuated system and make it follow arbitrary trajectories. That's close to right, but it's, it's still a second order system. You still have to go around the phase diagram if you've done, you know, we'll do phase diagrams on Thursday. Um, you know, you control an arbitrary acceleration, but not arbitrary paths, okay? Um, good. So uh, the rank condition is the simplest case, and I, and I try to start there because I think it makes, it makes sense. There are other things by this definition that um, can break under actuation. The under actuation idea is, rough, is, can you do feedback linearization? Can you produce an arbitrary acceleration? So. Um, if I had, for instance, limits on my torque, if I had actuator saturation, I just can't, the motor can only produce a peak torque of a certain amount, then um, that would be an input limit that can also give you the same symptoms and we call that under actuated too, when you're at the regime where you're saturating.
even state constraints, um, if you have joint limits or other things, that can interfere with your ability to follow arbitrary trajectories and make the control problem much easier. So this would be, for instance, like a joint limit. If you have a joint limit right in the meaningful part of your workspace that, uh, that can, you know, means the trajectory you want to take is unavailable to you, then you need some of the tools that we're going to talk about too. Um, when you get into things like I don't know F, well, I'll call that model uncertainty, or state uncertainty, measurement uncertainty, right? These things can lead to some of the challenges in the class, but it depends on how uncertain your model is. For small amounts of model uncertainty, we can just squish it with even more effort. Okay, and small state estimation errors too. All right, so you, you can, for, you know, if you have a robot and you have an, uh, you're fully actuated, you can still exploit nonlinear dynamics and, and do all the great things that I, that I try to advocate. Um, under actuation is just the technical condition that says you must. You don't have a choice. Doing the simple, the, the simple path to doing good control is not available to you. So um, it happens that because of that, you know, control theory has mostly gone towards doing the, the stronger mathematics that are available if you're fully actuated. And it, it takes this sort of under actuation condition to talk about, the, have the conversation we're going to have in this class. Okay, questions about that? Cool. So, um, I, like I said, I, I'm not expecting people to know uh, robot dynamics, robot kinematics, um, but you got to know what it looks like. So let me just do the simple, the simple version now, just to show you what these Fs kind of look like, uh, and then the deal will be that hopefully we'll never, we'll never do it again after this class. But I just want to sort of expose you to it if you haven't seen it that much. If you, uh, you know eat Lagrangians for breakfast, then you're going to be bored for a few minutes. I'm sorry. One of the things I like about the class, though, is we do get people with all kinds of different backgrounds. So, So, um, how do we get our equations in motion? We're going we're gonna to build this class around understanding dynamics like F. How do I get F, right? How do I design equations of motion for a mechanical system? Uh, you know, in a dynamics class, you, you, you'll do a lot of this, but I can give you a sense really quickly and give you what we need to know here. For the class, okay. So, um, imagine I have a simple double pendulum, where I have a point mass here, a point mass here, meaning that all my mass is concentrated right at these two circles, and I've got some perfectly massless rod connecting them. Okay. Um, I've got gravity pointing down. I'll call this theta one here, theta two here. So Q is my two joint angles, okay? Um, I guess I have to tell you how long these are. I'll call that L1 is the length of that rod, and L2 is the length of this rod, okay? So that's enough now for me to just generate F for this system. And it's, um, it's actually pretty simple, right? So. The first thing to do is just write the basic kinematics of the system, meaning I'm going to call the position of this point in space P1. It's 
the xy position of P1. So P1 is just what is L1 sine theta is my x coordinate. And then negative L1 cosine theta, assuming that zero theta is at the bottom. And I'm gonna shorthand that to be L1 S1, negative L1 C1. So I'll just, instead of writing sine theta one, I'm just gonna write S1, cosine theta one is C1, okay? Similarly, I can figure out what P2 is. It's just P1 plus um, L2 sine. Now the the angle here, you have to you have to do the work to convince yourself this is true, but it works out to be sine of theta one plus theta two plus my you know it's whatever position this was plus this increment. And you can take derivatives if you want to know what the velocity is. That's just taking the derivative of this position. L1, if I get a theta varies with time, L's constant. So I get a theta dot times sine goes to cosine theta, negative cosine goes to sine theta, like this, okay? I won't write it all out, but it's all in the notes, okay? And similarly, I can, I can get P1 and I can get P2. Okay, so now, given that, in this, in this special case of mass being concentrated at the points, I can write the total kinetic energy. Which we call T. It's one half mv squared. So it's one half um, P1 M1 P1. It's a little weird for me to put the M in there. I just want to, let me call it, let me write it the other way. That's the velocity, then the um, vector version of just V squared, right? That's the length of that vector plus one half M2, P2 dot transpose, P2 dot. I can write the potential energy. It's just M, G, M1, G, let's say Y1 plus M2, G, Y2. And that's everything I need, okay? So my, whole, my only point here is I want you to see that these things are not scary. They're, they come from very simple um, tools. I'm gonna write the kinetic energy, the potential energy. It's just algebra. You can do it for complicated things. You can do it for, for a simple pendulum, but you can do it for Atlas too, okay? The, the backflipping robot. Um, and then how do I go from T and U to my equations of motion like this? Well, I, I use Lagrangian <coughs> dynamics, for instance, right? So I define this new term, which is the Lagrangian L minus TU, and I just turn the Lagrangian crank. You don't have to know where it comes from for this, but it'd be good if you did. Um, <coughs> I just take partial derivatives of this of, of this term, and I can take this equation for each of my q's. So I'll do it once for theta one, another time for theta two. What's this thing on the side? This is my generalized 
force, which in this case is just going to be my, my torques at the joints, okay? If you turn the crank on that, pretty simple things come out. And I put them on a slide so I wouldn't have to write them up. Okay? If you run the Lagrangian, you're going to get two equations. One, when I run this Lagrangian through for I equals to one. A second one, when I equals two, right? The first equation goes goes through. I took derivatives with respect to Q1, okay? Derivatives with respect to Q2, I get two equations. Those are the two equations are the things that populate my F1 and F2, okay? Also good news, like I said, um, it's, it's a canned enough routine that uh, you don't have to do it, right? So in practice, Python's gonna do this for you, so. Ooh. Uh, if you, when you look at the code for your, for the first problem set, you'll get a taste of how these things work. But uh, you know that was a simulation of just simulating that equation forward. The good thing is I didn't have to type in any of this. All I had to type in was the description at this level, saying link, link, link in the standard robot description format, URDF, Universal Robot Description Format, um, right? And then it'll crank out the equations of motion for us. But just for sort of culture, just to make you a more complete human being, if you do this a few times, then um, you'll start to notice there's a pattern that emerges. That you're always kind of like, okay, well, this thing always kicks out some terms that smell like you know, one thing, and this always kicks out some terms that smell like another thing. And actually, that, that pattern is super important. There's more, even more structure in these equations than what we've done so far here. <clears throat> And that structure is called the manipulator equations, which is the other big idea I wanted to get across to you today. So if you look at the equations on the board, there's a bunch of stuff in front of Q double dots that are, that are sort of mass related, <laughs> okay? Um, so you end up having things that are a function of only Q. This one doesn't even have a Q dependence, but you have in general a function, a mass matrix Q times Q double dot, plus some terms that represent our sort of Coriolis forces, our, our, our coupling terms here, which we call C, Q, Q dot. And actually, there's always a term that's linear in Q dot on those, because the Coriolis forces are zero if the velocity is zero. Then you have a bunch of torques that are due to gravity, and those can only depend on Q. They don't depend on velocity. And then you have your control inputs U. So Same control input. In this case, it's a force or torque. And we're going to use this B again um, as whatever maps. It's like my actuator mapping, which says I put an actuator here, which joints does it affect? This is, uh, uh, I just say it maps. Nobody's actually named it. Uh, inputs. 
to generalized force. Yeah, so somehow there's a missing name for this somewhere. Like no one in the literature actually calls that anything. They just talk about it. Um, and I'm going to get away every lecture. I'm going to be totally happy calling it B. And I've never found a letter that I like better. There's one lecture where another B comes up in the same page or whatever, and I, ah, it drives me crazy. It's not the same B as the linear, as that B. It's almost the same B, but it's different. But um, yeah, we're going to call it B. The B matrix, yes? How is this related to what comes from the Lagrangian? It's exactly what comes from the Lagrangian. So what you, all, what you can see from what I've said so far is that I pump out equations like this, and I promise you that you'll always be able to group them into this, this form. Oh, okay. But in fact, there's deeper connections. So um, the kinetic energy turns out to be 1 half um, Q dot transpose MQ Q dot, for instance. The potential energy, this tau gravitational, is the deri is the derivative of the potential. Okay, this one's useful to to know because um, what does this tell me right right now? If this is my potential energy, um, one of the sorry, I just said potential energy. kinetic energy. You guys should yell at me if I say that. Um, this is my kinetic energy. Kinetic energy is always positive or zero. Right? It's always greater than positive semi-definite. So what does that mean about M? Positive definite. Okay. So what does that mean about my system if I start thinking about whether it's underactuated? Okay. Let me put it back into the other form. So MQ is positive definite. In fact, yeah, it's, for any reasonable system, it's actually positive definite. Okay. Um, if I wanted to write this into my original form, then I'm going to call it Q double dot is M inverse Q with this stuff, right? Tau G, tau G Q um, plus B Q minus C Q, Q dot, Q dot. Okay, so how do I look at my equation, my manipulator equations and decide if the system's underactuated? true. The, the part that's you know affecting how u affects q double dot is m inverse times b. But if I leverage this, then I can simplify even further. This thing's always going to be invertible. And so the condition for underactuation, you can just look at b and know everything you need. Okay. Yeah, it's kind of hiding there. That one I actually did put, but I just didn't do it very well. Nice. Okay, so let me just try to make this point quickly at the end here. So, <clears throat> I have a canonical form for my equations of motion. If I wanted to write the feedback linearization for this, I can use exactly that trick that I wrote here, substituting in my manipulator equations. And that's going to work for any robot that I can generate the manipulator equations for, which is every robot. Okay? Um, F2 is going to be invertible if exactly when B has rank. My simple double pendulum, if I have an actuator at both joints with no torque limits or anything, that's a fully actuated system. My claim is, not that it's not interesting, but it's just too easy. 
I could do anything I want with that. Okay, so I showed you um, the, sim the simulation of this of the system when uh, this is just when u equals zero, right? That's just the system falling. But I could basically, with feedback linearization, not only could I turn it into a linear system, I can turn it into any system I want. If I want that system to act like a single pendulum, I could do that. I'll just set up the equations so that the resulting q double dot is the equations of motion of a, simple, of a single pendulum. Sorry to be shifting on you there. Um, right? I can just basically erase the equations of motion that, that the world gave me and write in whichever ones I want. So if I want that system to act like a, symbol, a single pendulum, then no problem. I'll just feedback linearize it, and then suddenly it has exactly the dynamics of the simple pendulum. But it's, even, it's more than that, right? So um, I don't have to listen to gravity. I could just, I could change gravity. Let's say um, gravity is, uh, you know, it was 9.8 before, so let me do negative 9.8. Okay, now it's an upside down simple, simple pendulum, right? It doesn't matter, I could just take it, I could just erase any, I only have two degrees of freedom to work with, but I can write any two degrees of freedom I want in there, right? If you want it to be gravity is zero, then it's like, a, Pendulum in space, or something, right? <laughs> it doesn't matter. I mean, I can, I can set, I can set whatever terms I want, right? If the system's fully actuated, then I can cheat, and people do, uh, because that's what makes the math work. But to do better, to have birds landing on perches and uh, and uh, you know, backflipping robots, we have to do more. So that's what the class is about. Okay. Um, that's the, what I, the content I wanted to get through to today. So please, for logistics, there's going to be a problem set released tonight or tomorrow um, due in a week. And uh, if you could just log on to the website and sign on to Piazza once, then we'll, uh, we'll be connected. That's it. See you on Thursday.